Cooking is all about heat transfer. There's a lot of math and physics involved, but you don't need to become a physics major to understand and manipulate these principles. An understanding of what each cooking technique and medium is good or bad at, and how temperature manipulation affects these outcomes is essential, as is knowing these conditions affect on the food being cooked. Like in the difference between blanching vegetables and poaching a chicken breast. They are both accomplished by using heated, seasoned water. Knowing what temperature to use will mean the difference between a juicy, tender chicken breast or a dry and crumbly one. Knowing how much water to use will also mean the difference between bright green blanched vegetables and that unattractive army green color of canned green beans. Understanding how heat penetrates different food types will become extremely important when we start talking about cooking steaks and roasts to specific internal temperatures. Hello again and welcome to Hospitable You and the Introduction to Culinary Arts video series, Lesson 6, Kitchen Equipment. My name is Chef Jack and I'll be your host for this series. Now that we've covered knives, it's time to talk about the rest of the equipment used in a professional kitchen that you'll want to become familiar with. Before we get into the various cooktops and how to use them, we need to understand the term BTUs. BTU is an acronym. It stands for British Thermal Unit, and it's a measurement of energy. One BTU refers to the amount of energy that is required to increase the temperature of a pound of water by one degree Fahrenheit. A typical home stove puts out from 7,000 to 12,000 BTUs, a countertop butane burner puts out around 15,000 BTUs. A professional wok jet burner can get up to 130,000. So typically the higher the better in a professional setting because it gives you greater control and a higher upper limit if you need it. Though 130,000 is more than a little overkill in most settings. Wok burners put out that much heat for a very specific reason that we will get into in more detail once we start exploring wok technique in a later series dedicated to regional cooking styles. The different types of cooktops cooking surfaces as opposed to ovens, can roughly be grouped by their fuel source, being gas, natural butane or propane, electric, induction, and in some cases, steam. Natural gas and electric are common in most households, so there's really no mystery to these. Induction is a relatively new invention. These consist of a magnetic coil encased inside a frame, usually glass topped, but not always, and it uses magnetism to heat pots and pans. Once you turn it on, even at full blast, without a pot on the top of the cooking surface, it is cool to the touch even cold. Once you place a stainless steel or other magnetically attractive pot or pan on top, the magnetic field created by the coils inside begins to heat the metal and only the metal. This creates a much more energy efficient burner, with 85 to 90 percent of the energy produced being directly transferred to the metal to do the cooking. Butane burners are often portable and used in catering, camping, home uses, or wherever a burner is desirable but there is no room for a full stove. They are most often single burner units with a butane canister that fits into a compartment and locks in place. In food service, they are most often used on action stations where the cook is preparing food directly in front of the guests, like for banquet functions or the dreaded omelet station for a brunch spread. Steam jacketed kettles, griddles, and skillets are usually found in larger operations and are quite handy, if a bit pricey. They operate by an enclosed system with a boiler unit pushing steam around the surface that needs to be heated. Used for huge stock pots, pasta boilers, soup prep, braising, and even searing or sauteing in a flat tilt skillet, these designs can be very versatile if your operation can afford them. We've all seen the typical flat top grill, the engine of every diner kitchen in the country. There's also a cooktop known as a French top that resembles a flat top with no sides to prevent things from falling off. These are actually meant to be cooktops that you can position as many pots as you can fit in whatever configuration you want or need. These cooking surfaces are meant to transfer heat to cookware without direct contact with flames so they can get volcanic hot. They are very useful, but you must be respectful because they can and will remove multiple layers of skin if you accidentally lean on one and can quickly burn and melt clothing and aprons. There are a variety of different types of pots and pans used in professional kitchens. The best quality are heavy bottom stainless steel and clad with aluminum. What this means is that there is a disc of aluminum in the core of the base that is enveloped in stainless steel. This accomplishes multiple things at once. Softer metals like copper and the less expensive aluminum absorb and distribute heat very evenly, but some foods have a reaction to them. Iron and carbon steel are reactive as well. Reactive metals lose some material to the food that reacts to them, meaning you will be ingesting some of the metal of that pot. While iron is one of the best metals to cook with because it distributes heat very well, it holds onto that heat as well, so when searing meats, the pan won't cool down too much to get a good crust on the surface. Iron is metabolized by our bodies very easily and is an essential nutrient, so everyday cooking in iron pans is not really an issue. 
Aluminum and copper will also leach metals into your food, and these metals aren't as inert to our metabolism as iron, so everyday use is discouraged. The main chemicals these metals react with are acids and alkaloids, especially if cooked for long periods of time. Tomato sauce simmered in an aluminum pot will take on a metallic taste, and there will be a visible darkening of the pot where the sauce touched it and stripped away a layer of aluminum atoms. This all means that aluminum clad in stainless steel is the way to go. You get the best of both worlds, a pot with even heat distribution and no hot spots, so everything cooks evenly and you don't have to worry about the length of time the food spends in the pot, but these pans can be expensive. Never fear though, you can reduce the expenditure on cookware by knowing your operation and choosing pots wisely because aluminum pots still do have a place in the kitchen. They are best used to boil large amounts of water, which is an extremely common task in a kitchen. Proper cooking of starchy foods like pasta and potatoes requires salt and water though. Here we run into another issue. Salt corrodes aluminum, so the best use for aluminum pots in the kitchen is for stocks. By their nature, stocks need to be as neutral as possible, so acidic ingredients and salt are not ideal for these anyway. Typically when you're making a stock, you're doing so in extremely large batches, like 20 to 30 gallons or more. Aluminum has another advantage here in that a pot big enough to fit that much in it at once is going to need to be made of lighter material or you won't be able to move it around the kitchen without a forklift. Aluminum is much lighter than any of the other metals listed here so far, so it is ideal for large, bulky stockpots. Carbon steel is a great metal for thin pans and walks. It can take huge amounts of heat, heat up very quickly, blast that heat directly into the food so it sears and chars like no other metal, and is essential for the wok hay, a certain char and light aroma you get from a wok when properly used. It is possible to get this same effect in a French style carbon steel saute pan as well. These pans are astoundingly good at cooking fish and shellfish like shrimp. Because they are designed with extremely high heat in mind, they are little more than a sheet of carbon steel and a metal handle riveted onto it. So they can be used to sear one side of a fish fillet, flip it over to sear the other side, and if it's too thick to cook on the stove top by just searing the other side, the whole pan can be thrown in the oven to finish to the desired internal doneness. Just remember your dry side towel when you go to remove this pan from the oven. Shrimp cook so fast that just searing both sides long enough to get a little color, even at extremely high heat, will very often be enough time to cook it through. Let's move on to appliances. Next to knives and pans, these are the most important tools to manipulate food to get the results you want. The most common small appliance in a professional kitchen is the ubiquitous Roboku. These are very large, powerful food processors that have an array of attachments available to accomplish a variety of results. Of course, there's the standard bowl and blade attachments, but there are also graters, slicers of various thicknesses, and also dicing attachments. Deli slicers or meat slicers are another common sight in food service operations. A larger kitchen appliance, but not as large as an oven, they usually have an auto setting you can engage once you've dialed in the thickness of the slice you want, so you can walk away and let the machine do the tedious part for you. When slicing meats, however, these machines work best when there is a constant downward pressure pushing the food toward the blade. Relying on the auto setting will often give you less than optimal results. If the meat you are slicing is long or raw and soft, it could fall over and start slicing in the exact direction you don't want to slice it. The auto setting on these machines is best used for shredding vegetables like cabbage or lettuce. Stand mixers come in a variety of sizes for any operation's need. Bakeries or pizza shops might want larger units with the ability to mix large amounts of dough, while smaller units make the task of emulsifying mayonnaise and dressings infinitely easier than doing it by hand. These units almost always have an attachment hub that you can fit slicers, graters, shredders, and meat grinder attachments to and greatly increase their versatility. Even if a standalone meat grinder seems to make sense for your operation, having a stand mixer with a grinder attachment is a great way to minimize expenses and maximize limited space. Immersion blenders are a handy appliance to make small amounts of dressings, purees, emulsions, and foam. And they also come in a variety of sizes to be able to blend one quart or up to five gallons. They can also be fitted with various attachments like beaters and small food processor bowls. A Vitamix blender is also a must-have appliance. These units are pricey, but a good investment can liquefy ingredients and are great at making ultra-smooth purees, vinaigrettes, infusions, and can even be used as a spice grinder for softer spices. For harder spices like black or white peppercorns, you will definitely want a spice grinder. Essentially just a coffee grinder, but you don't want to use it for coffee after grinding spices for curry unless you wash it really well. Small and inexpensive, they are useful to have on hand. Some other more specialized appliances are vacuum sealers, commonly called cryovac, which are great for sealing things for little to no air exposure, to be frozen or for a sous vide application. Immersion circulators for sous vide applications are also a specialized equipment piece. If you are in an operation where rice is a staple, like any sort of Asian restaurant or a banquet slash catering operation, do yourself a favor and get a rice cooker. They come in gas or electric, 
from small enough to cook a few cups of rice to over 100 cups of rice at a time for the larger gas model. They are marvelous and underrated. Don't be a twit and think that it's cheating and that you can do just as well with a pan on the stove. It's not and you probably can't. It is possible, but it's a babysitting job that can be just as easily left for the machine to do for you. Wash the rice, add the proper amount of water, put the lid on, press a button, and then go do something more productive than checking on the flame under the rice every few minutes and having to adjust it. Rice cookers are great to have around, unless you're doing a peel-off or risotto method, but we'll get into those in another lesson. Ovens might seem like a self-explanatory category of kitchen equipment, but in a modern kitchen, many ovens can perform many other functions other than just baking. Usually referred to as a combi oven, they come with detailed temperature, humidity, timer settings, pre-programmable cook-hold functions, smoker, steamer, retherm, and multi-set processes that can be programmed and executed at the touch of a button. Ovens in modern food service kitchens have far outpaced the simplicity of conventional and convection ovens of 30 years ago. The leading companies in these categories are Rationale and Altosham. These two are certainly the most well-known though, and in my experience, the most reliable. With these units, you really do get what you pay for. So if you don't want to be calling out a technician every week, consider spending the money, or just getting less versatile units that will take up more space than a single unit. If your operation is a little more specialized, you might just want a simpler unit. Bakeries might do best with just a bank of deck ovens, and pizzerias have been using wood-fired stone floor ovens for decades. For steaming, there are several options you could look into. If you don't anticipate doing a lot of steaming, then a hotel pan of water placed over a burner and then fitted with a perf pan, perforated pan, and a lid will work in a pinch. There are also standalone units or Chinese bamboo steamers made to fit over a wok. Combi ovens also have steamer settings, if you're in an operation big enough to be able to afford one. Grills are fairly self-explanatory, but they come in a variety of different types, all focused on different fuel types. Gas, charcoal, electric, and wood-fired are all the primary types, and each one has different strengths and weaknesses. Wood-fired grills are great for steakhouses and give you a great smoky finish to a steak, but they need constant feeding and attention and require some experience to master. Gas grills are by far the most common and are extremely easy to use and adjust the heat output, but don't give food much character beyond just a char, which might be exactly what you need. Charcoal grills, like wood, require a lot of attention and some experience to master, and electric grills can be extremely compact and easy to move around. Choose the one that's right for the cuisine you're working in and learn its particular idiosyncrasies. Smokers are similar to grills, but you may not want direct heat. A Texas-style smoked brisket can take up to 16 hours if you want it to or if it's a particularly large brisket. So direct heat is not desirable here. Smokers also come in a variety of styles. Again, each one focusing on a heat source and a smoking style. There's usually an offset smoke box where the wood burns and creates heat, which are both vented into the smoking chamber where the food sits. At the opposite end is a chimney that vents the smoke out so it pulls it slowly across the food. There's usually a flap on top of the chimney to control the amount of smoke escaping and a vent on the smoke box to control the oxygen flow to the fire and coals. There are also electric smokers that burn wood pellets to produce smoke. By far the most common in industrial kitchens is the one with an electric heat coil that has a metal pan that fits over or on top that is used to hold the wood chips or whatever your preferred source of smoke is. Combi ovens, again, can be fitted for these functions as well. Steam wells and chafing dishes perform the same functions and are used extensively in banquet, catering, and buffet formats. There is a heated pan containing water that creates steam to heat another metal pan that sits on top that contains food of some sort. Hot boxes are also extensively used in these types of operations and are essentially a very low-powered oven, just hot enough to keep food at serving temperatures for extended periods. Which brings us to our focus, focus on, on food safety. 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 This week we'll be talking about time and temperature control. The most critical thing about holding food for long periods of time is to make sure it stays out of the temperature danger zone. We talked about this briefly in Lesson 2, Sanitation Basics. So here's a recap. Time and temperature controlled foods are things that need to be held hot for service, like soups and sauces, or cold, like salads and some desserts. These items need to be kept out of the temperature danger zone, in the range of 40 degrees Fahrenheit to 140 degrees Fahrenheit. This is the range at which bacteria will grow the most readily, and the longer a food needs to be held, the more important keeping it out of this range is. The health department guidelines here say that foods cannot be in the temperature danger zone for longer than four hours. At this point, they need to be chilled as fast as possible, heated to above 140 degrees as fast as possible, or just thrown out. What this means for banquet, catering, and buffet operations is you will want to create a log and take temperature readings of all the critical items being held at least every hour. This means hot and cold items. Mayonnaise, composed salads, raw egg sauces, and dressings left in the temperature danger zone for too long are just as likely to get someone sick as meats and dairy are. Cold foods need to stay below 40 degrees Fahrenheit, and hot foods need to stay above 140 degrees Fahrenheit. 
If in the unfortunate incident that someone reports a food poisoning in your operation, you can figure out what they ate, what time they were there, and double check your temperature logs to see if bacterial contamination might be the culprit. Assuming you are vigilant with your label and dating practices, keeping temperature logs will make it easier to track down the offending dish or ingredient, throw it out if needed, and be more vigilant moving forward. Today we talked about the different kinds of equipment you can expect to find in a professional kitchen, what each one's function is, their strengths and their weaknesses, and some basic operating guidelines. We discussed the different types of food service operations and what equipment they might need, and some workarounds for some operations that might have limited uses for certain types of equipment, and so might not want to invest a ton of money for an occasional use item. We also had a closer look at the importance of time and temperature control in our focus on food safety segment. Next time we will be delving into workstations, how to keep them organized, basic equipment, and the importance of another element of kitchen work often fanatically obsessed about, mise en place. So we'll see you next time. Hospitable You is produced by Hospitable Productions LLC and all of the people listed here. If you want to help keep Hospitable You free for everyone, please consider donating to our PayPal or become a Patreon on Patreon. Thank you for watching, and thank you for helping us create a more hospitable you.